As the warm glow of Christmas brightens our homes, streets, shops and workplaces, our hearts are burdened by a stark, dark reality. The disturbing rise of anti-Semitism in our own backyard. At a time symbolic of peace and goodwill, this year we face the jarring juxtaposition of deep-seated hatred taking root and gaining ground in our beloved Australia. We're deeply concerned by recent events in Victoria where masked individuals paraded through Ballarat's streets promoting hateful neo-Nazi ideology, including the burning of crosses. While some may say these are mere shows of bluster and bravado, history shows the spirit behind the emergence of such acts can stir up rapid, violent escalation, metastasizing and spreading suddenly without reason and without warning. And already the behaviors we're seeing transcend mere protests. Pro-Palestinian rallies around the country are chanting from the river to the sea, which is not a freedom cry, but a deeply ingrained call for the genocide and complete annihilation of the Jewish people. The veil is thin, and this repugnant behavior has no place in our peaceful society. From schoolgirls attacked for wearing Jewish school uniforms, to the violent intimidation of family members of Israeli hostages in Melbourne, these incidents go far beyond the realm of free speech. We have seen the protesters attempting to block the movement of cargo ships owned by an Israeli company, threatening the fabric of multicultural Australia, our treasured land of the fair go. The recent increase in such acts has been unmistakable and make no mistake, our country now hangs in the balance of one of the gravest geopolitical tensions of our lifetime. We ignore the potential consequences at our peril. At the Australian Christian Lobby, we firmly stand against anti-Semitism and aggressive, hate-fueled speech in all its forms. As we navigate these turbulent times, the ACL is also committed to prayer. We pray for the innocent on all sides of this conflict, both locally and internationally. Our hearts are with those affected by this wave of anti-Semitism who feel unwelcome and unsafe in our country. We stand in solidarity with the Jewish community. We acknowledge the volatility and complexity of this conflict and call for informed, nuanced discussions. Let us not be drawn into illogical lurching with the emotionally heated words of hate. Let us draw inspiration from the teachings of Jesus, who've challenged us to examine our hearts, saying from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, reminding us that harbored ill will towards our neighbor eventually spills out into the open. History teaches us that the outworking of hate is a futile endeavor, a losing strategy, leading us to a darker place. We are witnessing things in Australia that we have never seen before. True leadership is needed to confront and curb these hateful outbreaks. Law enforcement agencies should fulfill their duty in enforcing laws against hate symbols, gestures, chants and threats of violence. The rule of law must be upheld to ensure the safety of every individual, regardless of their backgrounds or beliefs. Let us remember the values that define us as a nation. Banning symbols of hate is essential, but so is education. Our cultural institutions, education systems and churches must address these issues head on. Individuals and groups supporting anti-Semitic acts in our country must be singled out and held to account. We must stamp out aggression and genocidal behavior at all costs. Our parliament and government must do more to ensure the safety and protection of the Jewish community, just like any other community. While the Labour Party may seem divided on the issue, our government must put politics aside to take a strong, decisive stance so that swift action can be taken before it is too late. Collectively, we can restore Australia's standing as one of the safest countries in the world, a place where every individual, regardless of their background, can be treated with dignity and respect, free from the shadows of hatred. Let this Christmas serve as a poignant reminder to reflect the values of peace and goodwill, love and compassion, just as Jesus showed compassion to mankind, even in the face of hostility, contradiction and the contempt towards him. His birth and sacrificial life made an emphatic statement by God of the intrinsic value of every individual made in his image. We would do well as a nation to remember this. May God bless you and your family this Christmas with his peace and may God bless Australia. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening on this uh, webinar to discuss uh, anti-Semitism and as it's happening in Australia. Now, uh, I was born in, in 1984 and I remember learning about the, the Holocaust in high school and I'm sure like many of you, when you first learned about it, it's uh, something that's so horrific and I remember dreaming about it because it just got into my, my heart, got into my mind 
and um, just such a truly tragic situation. And uh, what I thought before what happened on October 7th and seeing the anti-Semitism in Australia is I thought Australia was firmly against anti-Semitism. I thought that that was ingrained in who we were. However, seeing the rise of anti-Semitism just recently in Australia has, has showed that it is still there and it's still operating and it's um and it's and it's it's very very sad october 7 we saw the atrocious acts of evil perpetrated by hamas uh acts that are actually too horrific to to mention and like many of you uh i was drawn to prayer i, I was on my knees there was nothing else i felt i could do but but pray and we all know that prayer is is powerful so the focus of this webinar tonight is confronting anti-Semitism in Australia, but we know that what's happening in Australia is reflective of what's going on all around the world. And so we'll also cover about what's going on in the international community in regards to the rise of anti-Semitism as well. So we are very, very grateful to have with us tonight uh, three prominent guests. And, um, and we actually chose these guests specifically uh, because we wanted to give you a very well-rounded view of what's going on in regard to this issue. All three guests are friends of ACL and they all know each other as well. So, so that was good. And um, they all come with the unique contributions and unique perspectives. Dr. David Adler is the president of the Australian Jewish Association, which is a membership-based community organisation guided by authentic Torah values, as well as centre-right conservative Australian va values. Uh, Mark Jury uh, writes on relations between monotheistic faiths, human rights, and religious freedom. He's the founding director of the Institute for Spiritual Awareness, a writing fellow at the Middle East Forum, and a senior research fellow at the Arthur Jeffrey Center for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology. And Andrew Tucker is actually joining us from the Netherlands, and he is the Director General of the Hague Institute for International Cooperation, otherwise known as, um, as THINK. And he was a fellow of the law faculty of the University of Melbourne from 1994 to 2001 and research associate at the TMC ASSA Institute in The Hague from 1996 to 98. Um, and he's also the co-author of a book called Israel on Trial. So for everybody listening, there will be time for Q&A following the initial, uh, the initial panel discussion. So please do feel free to put your questions in the Q&A function. We'll try our best to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but before going to questions, uh, for my own questions, to these three gentlemen, I'd just like to provide a definition for anti-Semitism that David Adler actually drew my attention to, and I think it just frames the issue very well. Um, and it's something that the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance have adopted as their defin definition, and it says, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and or their property, toward Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. And so Australia is actually a member of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and this definition has notional bipartisan support, as David drew my attention to. It's notional because Although there have been supporting motions, which has passed in federal New South Wales, Victorian, and South Australian parliaments, it has not actually been implemented in any jurisdiction. So uh, David pointed out to me that recent events show the urgent need for this definition of anti-Semitism to be implemented in our laws across the country. So, uh, David, I wanted to go to you first because um, I I'm truly shocked by this. Um, I don't know if I'm naive to be shocked by this, but but I think my generation, uh, especially Christians in my generation, didn't realise that anti-Semitism uh, was in Australia to the extent that it is. Uh, did you have an idea that it did exist in Australia to this extent before we, we saw it rise in recent times? Um, Michelle, look, before I answer that, let me thank the Australian Christian Lobby for holding this event. Uh, it is really important that good people across the board uh, assist with this problem. Anti-Semitism cannot be beaten by the Jewish community alone. So your support is so welcome. And I, I want to th put thanks on the record initially. Um, we were also shocked. I mean, there'd always been some anti-Semitism uh, in Australia. Uh, there is a collation of anti-Semitic 
events uh, each year that the community undertakes. Uh, it's published in an annual report. There are certain incidents, um, but the, there was a game change on the 7th of October and the escalation, the explosion uh, was indeed shocking. Uh, even before Israel did anything in response to the barbaric Hamas atrocities, uh, we had that now infamous event at the Sydney Opera House where a mob was uh, chanting, uh, gas the Jews, uh, F the Jews. Mm. Um, we have additional video where they were also uh, chanting for an intifada, which is a program of terrorism to murder Jews. The, the breadth that it spread so quickly and so overtly has indeed shocked us. So we, we, we join you in, in, in sharing that shock. Uh, mm -hmm. It's had an enormous impact right across the Jewish community in this country. I didn't expect to see it in Australia either. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine personally what it would be like uh, to be a Jew right now um, in Australia, but anywhere in the world. Uh, what are you uh, hearing from your community? How do you feel, David? Um, and I'm sure you feel empathy for your community as well. How's your community responding to this? Well, we get an enormous number of incident reports and uh, the sort of things that are happening uh, range from uh, online harassment uh, right through to death threats. Um, I have personally received a significant death threat with my name on it. Um, I've never had so much contact with police, um, counter-terrorism police. Uh, I've had a, a number of meetings, uh, as well as with local police. Even had the Department of Home Affairs reach out to me because they were monitoring um, certain uh, incidents. There have been assaults. Uh, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne. There have been a number of arrests. I'm aware of 15 arrests uh, in Sydney in the last few weeks for anti-Semitism, and a lot of matters go unreported. One of the more heartbreaking aspects is that we've seen um, children uh, in schools and young people at universities uh, also harassed. We have reports of even students being chased, um, being abused, uh, just about everything you can think of. Um, we haven't had any murders in Australia, thank God, but we have had uh, assaults. So um, mm. people are, are in fear, to be honest, and the community has had to respond by increasing security. And we encourage the Jewish community to continue to do um, their normal activities, to go to the synagogues or Jewish facilities for events. Frankly, they are now the safest places uh, in Australia with the amount of security that's uh, been implemented. But as, as you implied up front, Michelle, um, this is not Australia. Um, Anti-Semitism is un-Australian and we have to have uh, all good Australians absolutely condemn it. Absolutely. And uh, we know that there are uh, religious implications to these tensions. And um, and Mark uh, has done a lot of study into, into Islam. And the media has actually, you know, reported these stories of sermons being preached in mosques, uh, which have attacked Jews. Mark, can you shed some light on what that's about? Yes, the the founding story of Islam uh, concerning the life of Muhammad and the beginnings of the Islamic community, include encounters with Jews. Um, Muhammad drove uh, tribes of Jews out of Medina and the last tribe he, he massacred. Um, and the Quran is, has many anti-Jewish um, themes in it. Um, Jews are treacherous, they're warmongers, uh, you, you, you can never trust them, Allah changed them into apes and pigs, they're greedy. Um, they start trouble everywhere. Um, they won't fight. They're they're weak and and cowardly. Mm. And I've been listening to a few of those sermons from from a Sydney mosque. There's a series of three on the Jews of Medina, which were the Jews that Muhammad wiped out. And it's really uh, what's really striking about them is that the speaker believes that the attributes that the Islamic tradition gives to the Jews of Medina 1,400 years ago 
are universally shared by all Jews in the world today. So he's able to take what Islam says about those Jews at that time and to say, well, all Jews are like this still today. So, I mean, that's part of the heart, I think, of anti-Semitism. You, you no longer see individuals as individuals or people as real people. You see them as a category, a kind of evil and vile category. And, um, and that, unfortunately, has been taught for a long time. I've seen those sorts of messages in school books uh, for Muslim children, um, I became first interested in this more than 20 years ago, visiting a, um, a cake shop in Brunswick in Melbourne and seeing anti-Semitic brochures, very glossy brochures being handed out. So I've been tracking it for a long time. And there are um, sermons across the Middle East, country after country, all the time, and have been for years and years and years, anti-Jewish sermons. So um, it's. I would say anti-Semitism is hardwired in in Islam, and we're seeing mm -hmm. we're seeing the fruits of it here. Um, one final point I wanted to make is I think the Muslim Brotherhood, who in a way sponsors Hamas, has a global network, and I'm really sure that um, what you saw as an outbreak of, of protests and movements all across the world has been coordinated, and part of its purpose is to intimidate Jews wherever they are. It was deeply disturbing to see anti-Palestinian, sorry, pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protesters go into Caulfield in Melbourne and protest outside a synagogue. That's, again, it's a symptom of the mindset that, th that there's a generic category of Jews, including Israel, but also Caulfield as well. And you can, as it were, push your message of hate into, into the face of a Jew wherever they are. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's it's horrific and it's serious. And we have we have taken this um, to our bosom. You know, we have embraced this these some of these ideas, and they've become part of the fabric of our culture. And it's uh, it's very deeply disturbing, and it, we need to stand against it. It's it's difficult because we've be, we've gone down this track for quite a long time, and the problem's been brewing. I must say I haven't been surprised at what's been happening. It's consistent with what I've been seeing for 20 years. Interesting. And um, a lot of Australians would think this is about land rights, uh, not about uh, religion. And I think in Australia we're familiar with land rights. To what extent is this about land rights and to what extent is this about religion? I think it's um, land is an issue in, 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 in Israel and Palestine. Obviously, it's an issue to both sides. But I believe it's fundamentally religious drivers on the Islamic side, on the Arab side. Uh, Hamas is a, just a full-on religious organization. Its goal is a universal caliphate. Their plans are not just limited to Israel. Um, um, but the objection, the objection is based on a theological idea that once land has been conquered for Islam, it belongs to the Muslims forever, and it cannot be, it must not be given back or taken back. And the mm -hmm. presence of a Jewish state in the middle of the Islamic world, which was conquered and occupied by Islamic forces, is deeply um, offensive to, to Muslims. Mm -hmm. And um, the Palestinians have been caught up in that hatred as well. And then it gets fed by these tropes that, that come out of the religion itself. Um, there's two particular ideas that come together that I've seen in a lot of these sermons from Hamas and groups like that. One is that um, Jews uh, love life more than death. That is, they won't fight, whereas Muslims love death. So we will fight to the death, but they won't. They'll give in. So they're cowardly. The Quran says they'll turn their backs and run. And the other thing that the Quran says is that Jews are warmongering and they'll create, wherever you see a war, the Jews have started it. So these two beliefs go together. They're starting wars, but they're cowardly and, and, they, and they're treacherous. So the only way that the, this leads you to the implication that you should may as well fight them because they're going to fight you anyway and you're going to beat them because they're cowardly. So this, these ideas just like act as a fire for war and they, they ignite the, the, the heart and soul of people. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen and we know that in the Palestinian Authority and Hamas both feed uh, these ideas into children and school children and it's been notorious the mm. the, the teaching of hatred to children and and it's a generation it becomes a really a generational problem
And there seems to be a real naivety amongst the international community and amongst our own politicians as to the ingrained religious nature of this this issue. But um, and that goes to to the UN. And I'll I'll go to you, Andrew, because we see the UN taking a certain standpoint on this, no doubt um, influenced by an ungodly secular agenda. <laughs> What's your take on the role of the United Nations in this conflict, and what damage are they doing? Thank you, Michelle. And again, congratulations on organizing this event. I think it's very important, very timely. Um, listen, I, I, like Mark, I've been studying this whole issue of the place of the Jewish people in Israel in the international legal system um, for a couple of decades. And I, I think in a way, the attack on Israel on the 7th of October symbolizes the attack that is by the Islamic world generally, but also other actors on our international legal system. Um, in a way, you can say the system that's been built, the UN system since 1945, built on the ashes of the Shoah, is a post-Christian system. It's an empty shell it's a legal system which is devoid of any morality or Christian, Judeo-Christian uh, values. Um, and so it's interesting. I've, I've, I'm just thinking of the words of Jesus that we read in Matthew 12, at the end of Matthew 12, when Jesus talks about the house um, that um, he says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house that I left. It arrives, finds it, uh, occupies, and it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was at the first. Now, to me, that symbolizes the modern international legal system. We destroyed the Jewish people in Europe. International law is a European kind of system that developed the Jewish people were very much part of it right through the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. But after the Shoah, the, uh, the secular world took over and created this system which was devoid. We removed the, the, the spirits and created an empty shell. And we've seen the Islamic world, but also the world of the former Soviet republics, Marxism. We've seen secular ideologies take over the system. To the point where now, I mean, already long before 19, before the October 7th attack, we see virulent anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in the UN. We've seen it for decades, especially since the 1970s. Um, and we in the West have failed to stand up to this because we've lost our sense of orientation. This is where, again, I think the church has failed uh, badly because we failed to be a voice into our nations. Um, and that, that is also because of replacement theology. You know, we've lost our sense of the importance of the Jewish people in our society uh, and why it's important to stand with the Jewish people. So all of this, I think, sort of coalesces into this uh, place where we are now, anti-Zionism in the United Nations. Um, and then there's the whole human rights system, which we've created. Interestingly enough, 1948 was significant for two very important reasons, uh, maybe three. One of them was the creation of the State of Israel, which is a modern phenomenon. It's unique. Secondly, it was the creation of the Declaration on Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which created a system that's now being used against the Jewish people. Right? People are only talking now about war crimes that Israel is committing, the Jewish people are committing. We're not even hearing in the resolution that's been passed this week about refusing to condemn Hamas for war crimes, but only focusing on the Jewish people. Um, and also in 1948, we had the creation of the World Council of Churches, which is also a very anti-Semitic institution based on replacement theology. So I think the world changed significantly, um, and we are in, in a very post-Christian, post-Judeo-Christian world where the, the paradigm um, has fundamentally changed. And we need a new approach, a new strategy for thinking about how do we defend the Jewish people and Israel in this secular post-Christian uh, legal system. Don't forget, legal systems are only as good as the people who use them. The Germans had a wonderful legal system and they used it brilliantly. And I think we're seeing a repetition of that 
The beautiful legal system, it's a good legal system, the UN, but it's been completely misused and um, and it's been hijacked by the enemies of the Jewish people. Mm. And that reminds me of our situation in Australia as well, where um, we have politicians uh, showing signs of their own anti-Semitic uh, anti-Semitic behaviour. And we can see that worldview, that secular humanist sort of worldview influencing our um, our culture here as well. And uh, uh, David, well, what what's your impression of how um, the politicians here have responded to the rise of anti-Semitism? Well, we, we have a spectrum, uh, Michelle, uh, starting at the lowest of the low, you'd have to uh, call out the Greens. Um, and interestingly, um, they're probably the furthest away from religious values as well, from the Judeo-Christian values. Um, they are the only political party uh, in Australia to have actively rejected the definition of anti-Semitism that you read out. Um, and they take such an extremist view, it, it's shocking. Uh, I recently did an interview with... Uh, former Minister for Foreign Affairs, Alexander Downer. And he had um, basically said, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase uh, his message. Uh, I used to think that the Greens were just an extremist environmental party. Uh, now I know they're much worse. They are an anti-Semitic cult. Uh, all good people should ensure that they're wiped out electorally. Mm. So that's that's the bottom end. Um, we have a, a, a problem with uh, some in Labor, uh, and we have seen a shift between, I guess, what was the previous Labor Party that had uh, some good people in it in terms of their relationship with the Jewish community in Israel. And I'll name people like Michael Danby, um, the late Senator Kim Kimberly Kitching, uh, Mike Kelly, um, and now I'm scratching my head to find uh, good people in Labor, and the Labor policy has uh, has shifted significantly. The sort of education system that uh, was described about teaching people hate, while uh, certain countries have withdrawn fund funding, our Australian Labor government has doubled its contribution to UNRWA, which is responsible for some of the schools uh, in Gaza and in Judea, Samaria, or, or uh, the West Bank. Uh, Peter Dutton, to his credit, has been one of the most uh, moral and clear in uh, in calling out the issues. And uh, a couple of the minor parties have been uh, very good. Uh, the Liberal Democrats and One Nation as well, uh, frankly. So we have a spectrum but I, i've got to say in summary that the pendulum has swung mm. uh, a bit towards the negative mm. uh in the last few years a bit towards the trend that uh andrew described we we also see happening in australian politics yeah and when you think about what's going on in the on the ground um, with enforcement do you think the police are doing enough to curb what's happening on the streets it doesn't look like it but what's absolutely your not yeah. uh i mean while they have pursued some incidents, and uh, if we want access and want to talk to them, they're very civil, very pleasant, and very helpful, and they have investigated some incidents for us. When you look at the big things, uh, dealing with the hate preachers that Mark described and the confrontation that occurred in front of Caulfield um, or also the intimidation down to Coogee in, in, in Sydney uh, similarly. But the worst was what happened in Sydney uh, immediately after the 7th of October, where we had, uh, we were supposed to have the Opera House lit up in blue and white colours as uh, a sign of empathy towards the victims of the terrorism. And instead, um, the Jewish community was warned to stay away from the town hall and the opera house. Mm -hmm. uh, at the opera house, there were the hateful chants, the burning of flags, the letting off of flares, and the police stood and watched. Mm -hmm. uh, something is wrong 
with our law enforcement when an, an important iconic part of that major city is basically handed over to mob rule mm. and the law abiding citizens are told to stay away for their own, own safety. That would seem to me to be a complete inversion of, of what should be happening in a democratic country. Yeah, because there is current laws that they they should be enforcing. And uh, Christopher, our Director of Public Policy, will come on soon to give us that legal perspective of what right. laws they should be enforcing. But I, I wanted to ask you um, and each of you actually about um, just response, how community and how law should should respond. But but particularly to you, David, how, how should ordinary citizens respond if they see um, an anti-Semitic act or symbol within their own neighbourhood? They see something going on. What should they do? Well, uh, there's there's basically two or three things that uh, can be done. Firstly, it needs to be recorded. We we sometimes get people who ring up and say, uh, I, I've seen such and such. And I'll say, did you take a photo? Uh, because the most it's, it's very important to have uh, evidence. Uh, most people carry mobile phones, pull it out, use it. Mm. Uh, um, we need to uh, to have the record. Uh, if it's significant, um, I would encourage people to to make police reports. They do have a job to do, and if we don't make reports, then um, they they can't pursue it. Uh, for the bigger things, uh, organisations like ours can take matters uh, to the media. Mm -hmm. uh, the big one that we've all been talking about at the Opera House, um, we had a a young guy down there uh, with his phone uh, who took the video. The next morning, the video was uh, given to me. Um, we took a clip, which was the chanting. Uh, we put it on our social media where it was seen by literally millions. One of the uh, one-minute clips on our Twitter was seen by six million people, and we started getting approached by media around the world. Public pressure is important. And we can lift public pressure to take action. And that brings to the last point, which is the uh, the political. Uh, our politicians do have a job to do also, mm. and that is to act in the interests of the society, and that includes law enforcement, includes um, making Australia a, uh, a civil place. Mm. Uh, and while we have some freedom of speech and some democracy, uh, we should use it. We can make representations to politicians, any individual can, and uh, ask them to um, exert pressure uh, to ensure that the law enforcement is, is put in place. Um, there are some preventative things which perhaps we can discuss down the track, Michelle, but if, uh, mm -hmm. if people see things, I, I would uh, urge them to do those sort of actions. Yeah, thank you. And and um, Andrew, in regards to international law and its place in stopping this from escalating, because uh, we can see these anti-Semitic uh, anti protests leading to violence, which we know if it continues to escalate can lead to something even more tragic. What place does international law have to hold this back? Oh, oh, unmute myself. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, Michelle, unfortunately, the difficulty is we've created a, a, I'll go back to my point about human rights systems. You know, it's very difficult now to use the legal system to fight against hate uh, speech because it's it's being used both ways, right? Mark knows about this better, better than I do, about how the, the hate speech system is being used against uh, those who speak out against anti-Semitism and anti um, opposition to Islamic hatred and violence. Uh, so they're using that system. I mean, we had last week the presidents of major Ivy League universities in America testifying to the Congress, and they were unable to state unequivocally that hate speech calling for the genocide of the Jewish people is against their policies of um, preventing hate speech and violence. So we have a, I think we have a, um, an intellectual institutional problem here 
that needs to be attacked. Um, Anti-Semitism is a phenomenon of a deeper problem. And we need to be talking about what that deeper problem is, not just the symptoms of anti-Semitism. Um, and so, so I would be arguing for, you know, in the intellectual leadership of our nation. It's a fight, I believe, for the heart and soul uh, of our nation. The way we treat the Jewish people is symptomatic of the way we treat Christianity and all, um, all religions. So... Uh, I don't think the legal system itself, the international legal system, is extremely helpful to us. It's more problematic than it is uh, helpful. Um, it's about the choices that we make within the confines of that legal system. And I think our leaders need uh, people like David and Mark and others to be understanding uh, the deeper problems that they are dealing with. Yeah, that's right. And there's a role for for Christians within that changing the hearts and minds of the nation. Um, heard a quote, as goes the church, so goes the nation. And so Christians really need to be leading the way. And um, Mark, what what position do you see Christians taking in terms of responding to this? There's, there's divisions even amongst the Christian community. But for those who particularly, um, uh, uh, you know, really saddened by this, that align with, um, with what we're speaking about here, how should they respond? I think Christians are divided. Uh, those on the more progressive end of, of uh, Christianity tend to be pro-Palestinian, whereas more conservative Christians in general tend to be more sympathetic to the to the situation of the Jews and more concerned about anti-Semitism. And um, I think that's uh, that's been I've been encouraged to see that that people speaking up. I think they need more. We need more people to speak out. People that have a voice. Uh, to to have the courage to say to call evil for what it is and to stand against it because we we're sort of in a 1930s situation. This is not just a passing thing. It's a watershed moment, and people need to rise up and speak out. We need journalists encourage them to speak out as well, and some are, thank goodness. I mean, one one friend of mine, a Jewish friend, said he's just been amazed to see how strong uh, the reaction. Um, so sympathy for the for the Jews and the opposition to anti-Semitism is amongst conservative Christians around the world and wondering why that's that is. And I think that just needs to be encouraged. And one of my desires is to resource people to understand what's happening and and to make sense of it. Um, I think it is, I agree with Andrew that it's a it's a civilizational crisis we're in. It's, we need a spiritual and cultural renewal. Um We've actually, our concept of what is evil has become very weak. Uh, we don't see the capacity for individuals to be evil. We, we locate evil out there somewhere in mm. some institution or some race or, or some group, you know, and and we, we're, in, we're losing the ability to see it in our own hearts. And that's, that's disturbing. So we mm. need to, um, I've just encouraged people people to preach and to speak and to resource to get the information they need so they can communicate clearly to their people, uh, certainly to pray. Yeah. Um, I think it's not incompatible with a concern for anti-Semitism that you also have compassion for the victims of war in the Middle East. Um, Muslims themselves have suffered tremendously often from Muslims in, in, in warfare across the Middle East. And just because you you're totally opposed to anti-Semitism and see it as a huge threat to our society doesn't mean you you, you lack compassion for all the victims of war. Mm. Um, so that's important as well. So I'd encourage people to be, have some would say soft hearts and hard heads, um, be committed to both truth and love and not to compromise one for the sake of the other. Sometimes Christians compromise truth for the sake of love and they end up in a very unloving and destructive space. So I just just encourage people to get engaged. This is not a time for sitting in your home and hoping it'll all pass. It's not a time for thinking, oh, this, you know, I don't have to deal with this. This is not my problem. This is everyone's problem. And, and, and one more thing I'd say for Christians, there's a saying in the Middle East, Saturday comes before Sunday. Exactly. And um, Christians are already suffering in many countries and our media give very little attention to this. And um, it's, this is not going to stop just at the Jews, this, this sort of hatred. And we already feel the pressure of it. Um, there have been across Europe a lot of attacks on churches 
this is not a time for Christians to be quiet. It's a time to stand up and speak. Yeah. And um, we're somewhat encouraged um, by biblical prophecy, which points towards peace in Israel. Um, this is an open question, but how how do um, you see that playing out? What's the movement towards peace in Israel? Yes, I I believe the promises of God to the Jews in the scriptures are irrevocable and they ha they stand today and i'm not a not committed to particular end time scenarios or anything like that but i totally believe that god has a particular love for the jews he loves all people all that he has made as the scriptures say but a particular love for the jews and that i think he will care for them i think the reality is for israel is that they have to fight for their survival and they're ready to do that and they're not going to turn their backs on this. And they, we should encourage them in, in that as much as we can, because the alternative is another Holocaust all over again. And that's, that's something which Israelis are absolutely determined not to let happen. And yeah. so they will, they will fight for their freedom. And I think Christians need to say, we, we understand that that's what they need to do. They need to actually fight for their survival. And, and it's as simple as that. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I we should pay for the pray for the peace of Jerusalem, absolutely, and for all the peoples of the Middle East as well. They all need peace. <laughs> um, I've seen lots of Muslims become Christians, hundreds in recent years, and many of them are just desperate for peace. They're seeking peace, um, so by all means, pray for it. But realize also that, as Paul says, the the political rulers um, use have the military for to bring order and peace, and that is their responsibility to, to, to use those resources to, the, to that purpose. Yeah, sure. And I'm um, just going through some questions and answers. So um, if, if anybody has questions to ask, um, please put it on the Q&A chat. But uh, so there's a couple of questions just about um, asking if, uh, if, if I, I suppose you believe, Mark, if all Muslims are, um, have this anti-Semitic view, or is it a portion of the community? Yeah, I didn't say all Muslims have that view. And I definitely wouldn't say that. What I'd say is that it's hardwired into the Quran and Islamic renewal movements such as Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and many others, which look to the Quran and the example of the early Muslims as their, their foundation for renewal of, and, and, and for an awakening of the, Islamic, of the Islamic world. And that's been a movement for the, more than 100 years across the Muslim world. Those groups that look to the Quran for their guidance, they are they get pulled into anti-Semitism. Now, not all groups are like that, and there are certainly Muslims who'd be horrified about those anti-Semitic sermons. So, it's important not to stereotype Muslims, but the ideology is clear and it's deeply disturbing. And it, the question is, who is following that ideology, and how can we address that issue? Mm, yeah. Uh, somebody's written for um, for you, David, that what are some practical ways that Christians can provide meaningful help and support to Jews here in Australia? Well, we're seeing a tremendous example of that tonight. Uh, and I, I support what Mark said about uh, now is the time for uh, Christians to stand up, to help, to articulate, um, to call out the issues um, we get uh, quite a few messages sent to uh, our organisation from Christians, and I don't want to encourage any more, please. We we, uh, we probably get many more uh, emails and messages and items that we need to deal with than we can actually process uh, at the moment, but it is very reassuring uh, and, and very supporting. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. To, to stand up for truth, um, to call out uh, uh, any problems. We received a, a letter today from um, uh, a church in Sydney, which people can have a look at on our social media. We were so pleased to receive it. We put it on the HAA uh, Facebook page and Twitter, uh, and the community reacts positively to that. It's at a time when there's some things to be depressed about, it is actually very encouraging and lifts one's spirits and morale mm. to know that there is uh, a volume of 
people out there who are who are supportive. I I keep getting told that actually uh, the quiet majority is is like that in Australia, and I, I suspect that's that's true. That if uh, you know an anti-Semitic in, uh, vote was taken, uh, the vast majority of people in Australia would would vote against anything that allows uh, anti-Semitism to to flourish. But we, we do have a problem that we need to deal with, and um, those sort of supporting things are uh, are, are really really good. Yeah. May I make it? May I make a small point? A uh, yeah. short point. Um, mm -hmm. If you're speaking with somebody and they start talking about the Jews and they make a generalization, Jews are like this, or, no. you know, this will always happen to them, or and they'll never learn until this happens. When they start talking about Jews as a collective, as if they were all the same, and you know exactly what they're like, that's what anti-Semitism looks like. That is anti-Semitism. That's the foundation of it. And so if someone says that in a conversation, and I've had conversations with Christians where those sorts of views are expressed, that's the point to say, no, that is wrong. The, mm -hmm. you, 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 that is completely wrong thing to do. People are people, they're very diverse. You do not, you cannot stereotype, you must not stereotype a whole group of people. It is deeply offensive and very damaging. So I think if, if people were able to just stand up and speak into those sorts of conversations, that would make a huge difference. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I would I would draw then the line even further, Mark, and what we're seeing is an anti-Semitic approach towards the state of Israel as well. And I think we need to push back against this criminalization of the state of Israel, which we've seen over the last decade or so, uh, these increasing calls against the Jewish state of Israel for being an apartheid state. Israel is committing a genocide against the Palestinian people. Israel is committing war crimes this whole kind of rhetoric of the cr the criminal status of the Jewish state, I think we really need to uh, be speaking out very strongly against this. And our government should never be voting or, or going along with uh, this. I, for example, Australia is putting a lot of money into the Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry against uh, it's it's a it's a pogrom. It's it's a star chamber which has been set up to basically attack the Jewish state of Israel and undermine it from within. And I think it's uh, unacceptable that that a country like Australia supports financially any institution like that, which is so virulently anti-Jewish. And it's doing exactly what Marx says: it's stigmatizing a people simply for being who they are. Absolutely. The, uh, Michelle, at the beginning, quoted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. One of the things that uh, is in that document below the actual definition is certain working examples. And the working examples um, help to identify the line between um, reasonable discussion and debate and criticism about Israel versus going into anti-Semitism. It was the former chief rabbi of the Commonwealth, uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who described uh, the way anti-Semitism changes as a bit like a virus that morphs, and everybody now knows about viruses that morph. Um, that, you know, back in time when, for example, during the Inquisition, there was hatred of the Jewish religion and torture and forced conversion. You go forward, um, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, had a hatred of Jewish culture and certain practices were banned and there were pogroms against the Jewish people in the Soviet Union. The Nazis, of course, took a racial view and they had ways of defining, uh, having their own definition of a Jewish race and their objective was to eliminate the Jewish race and now it's morphed towards hatred of the Jewish state so that that particular collection of wisdom is, um, is I credit to Rabbi Sachs but it, it it finishes at exactly the point that Andrew was making and that is that um, the current modern form of anti-semitism is often anti-Zionism and as I said, you can criticise Israel as you would any other country, but the sort of things that we've seen uh, on the streets of, of Sydney, 
the obsession about the world's only Jewish state. So uh, Pakistan is currently expelling roughly 1.7 million Afghanis uh, in the most horrific circumstances, and you don't see uh, the Muslim communities uh, protesting in the streets of Sydney and Melbourne for the 1.7 million that are currently uh, being persecuted and many will die uh, as a result of, of that. Um, but if the IDF is going after Hamas, and despite the most complex urban warfare with tunnels and human shields, um, a certain proportion of civilians um, uh, are killed in the conflict despite best efforts to minimise civilian casualties. Oh, that's genocide. Well, clearly it's not, um, but that's anti-Semitism. Yes, yeah. it's the disproportionate focus on 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 Israel um, is is one of the symptoms of anti-Semitism. For example, more than eighty thousand Yemeni children were starved to death in the in the conflict there between one Muslim group and another. And uh, university students in Australia were not protesting with all the deaths of the children. They weren't marching in the streets and chanting. Um, they didn't care, really. Hmm. They didn't care. But why, do, why, why are people caring now? Because it's Jews, because it's Israel. That's the only explanation for the incredibly disproportionate response that we're seeing. And I, I just plead with, with people who have some decency who've been accepting these labels like genocide and concentration camps and everything, to just expand your view and think, is this the way that you really think about all the other conflicts in the world and all the other circumstances where people are being abused? Yeah, it's um, yeah, right. it's deeply disturbing. Yeah, a um, few people drawing the, the um, connection between wokeness, progressiveness, as we um, discussed earlier, but... Andrew, do you want to just expand on that? Why is there this connection between wokeness, progressiveness, I suppose, left and um, and anti-Semitism? Oh, that's a big uh, that's a big question, Michelle. I think uh, it's we've kind of you know with modern critical legal thinking and critical uh, thinking, we've kind of developed this idea that the world exists out of perpetrators and victims, you know. Um, so you have perpetrators and you have victims, and that explains the world and explains history. So, you know, we've had this whole thing about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, this growing idea that um, the West is to blame for every wrong that's in the world. So the West is to blame for the existence of the state of Israel. The West is to blame for the existence of the Jewish people as a nation in the Middle East. Um, so I think, you know, we do need to, to speak out very clearly, uh, into this to say that this, the modern state of Israel is, is the perfect example of decolonization. Exactly. You know, it is the paradigm of the, the restitution of a people that is native to its land against colonization. It was the Arabs who colonized, uh, the Middle East. When they, when they moved up in the 7th century from Saudi Arabia and took over the Middle East. And Judaism and even Christianity existed there before. So, we, you know, we have people groups in Syria and Iraq um, amongst Lebanon um, who are, are fighting for their identity and existence against this kind of overwhelming uh, Islamic um movement that's seeking to create a kind of caliphate again, we need to be standing with all the peoples of the Middle East, including the Jewish people, uh, who all deserve to have a national identity in the land. So to my mind, you know, the state of Israel and the Jewish people, let's not forget that 20% of the population in Israel are, are Arabs, uh, and they enjoy living in a democratic state where their rights are recognized and they have the freedoms of religion and worship that they nobody has in the Middle East. Mm. So I think we need to be fighting for um, uh, fighting, but but arguing, articulating the case for why Israel uh, is is an important example of the values that we purport to represent in the West, namely, 
um, respect for human rights, respect for human dignity. Mm. And the State of Israel, I believe, is the mechanism, the tool for achieving uh, respect for human rights in the Middle East. You just imagine a world without Israel. What would the Middle East look like? Yeah. What would it look like if Hamas was running uh, all yeah. Palestine? Can I add something uh, to that, Michelle? Mm. Um, I think the, it all goes back to um, what it is, means to be human. And let me explain. In, in Western secular culture, we've sort of bought into the idea that the point of being human is to self-realize, to become the best person that you, you can be, to be your best you, yourself. It's very self-centered and self-focused. But part of that ideology is the idea that the person's essentially good, you know, because if self-realization is the purpose, then obviously people must be good in order for realization to be good. Because if people were evil, self-realization would be a disaster. So we have bought into this idea that uh, it's affecting education, it's affecting gender, it's affecting views of sex and lots of things in our culture. But one of the, the costs of this view that basically people are good and they should self-realize is there's still evil in the world, but it's out there somewhere. It's in that class of people or it's in that race or that religious group or somewhere else. It's the it's the it's the colonial West oppressing the the you know the the, the poor natives of the world or whatever it is, <laughs> um, and it's out there. And one of the um, the incredibly damaging things that happens when a whole group of people think that evil is out there and not in themselves is that they become capable of extraordinary um, acts of of uh, of of, de of evil against others, and they believe they're doing it out of righteousness. And there was a story that when I think it was um, Lenin died and people exposed the the maybe it was Stalin the wrongs that he did, many of the the guards who'd worked in the gulags committed suicide mm. because they thought they were they were serving an, an idea, uh, an ideal, and they realized it was corrupt. And one of the problems is that in this in this kind of phase that we've moved into, where um, the value of the person is just to be their very best self. Um, you know, the, the nature of evil is still there, but we're locating it elsewhere. And, in, and at the moment, many of us are locating in the Jews. They are the source of evil in the world. You know, they are the ones that are controlling the the world, the economic system. I mean, that, that's not true, but that's the way people are thinking. But if someone could say, "Look, maybe evil, as Solzhenitsyn said, is actually part of me, and I have to deal with that in myself," and in fact, maybe all people are like that. You know. The Jews are not uniquely evil, or even the Muslims are not uniquely evil, or or you know white people are not uniquely evil. This is not the right way the world. This is not the way the world works. But that that ideology and it's the the wokeness the the wokeness is associated with a wholehearted embrace of this concept of the human person of the self realizing individual, and mm. that is driving this. I must say, you know, many Jews have found that longtime friends in the left, on the left of politics that they've invested a lifetime in, have let them down at this time, and they're in shock because of all over the world. We're hearing this from Europe and from America and Australia. People who voted Democrat or Labor all their life have suddenly found that all their the people they thought were their friends are actually part of the problem, and that's caused a shock to them. Uh, and it's part of the trauma. It's part of the trauma the Jews are facing at the moment. Andrew, I was just wondering if you could share any any final words of of hope. Um, what can you say to encourage us this evening? Thank you, Michelle. Appreciate that opportunity. Listen, we keep our hearts and our minds focused on what God is doing. So we must not forget that God is in charge of this world. He is in control. And he will send his Messiah to the world to bring peace and justice. I believe really that the calling of the church, the body of Christ, is to be preparing the way for, uh, for the Lord. We, we work for justice. We work for truth and righteousness today as much as we can. But I think that forward-looking um, approach, I, you know, when we see evil on the rise, um, and Jesus said, you know, hold your heads high. Your redemption is is near. And um, I think there's a spiritual battle here, a spiritual also a battle for the hearts and minds of the body uh, of Christ, the, the church. 
Um, I think repentance is needed. I think we've got to get down on our knees. And I think we've got to um, ask the Lord to, to intervene. So, so many of these problems are much bigger than we can handle. And so I just want to encourage everybody to um, let's, not lose, let's not lose faith. Let's not be despondent. Um, we don't believe in democracy as the answer to the world's problems. We believe in the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who will send his Messiah. We believe it's Jesus Christ, our Lord, and, and he's coming. So uh, let's get ready, waiting and watching and praying. I just want uh, to to really thank you from the bottom of my heart to to Mark, Andrew and David. Thank you for presenting this evening and giving up your time. But thank you for what each one of you are doing to confront this massive issue. Um, and uh, it does take boldness at this time because of the, um, the the threats that come against people that stand up. So thank you for continuing to make that stand. And David, we do stand with you. We stand with the Jewish community. Absolutely. Michelle, this is such a I didn't expect that this initiative would be taken tonight, and I want to let everyone know how how touching it is. Um, I, I said that you know getting messages of, of support helps to um, lift one's morale um, and be supportive at this time. But what you're doing is is a step beyond. Uh, it, it's just such a wonderful initiative, and uh, you can be assured uh, that if not tonight, then tomorrow morning it'll be shared on the largest. Jewish platform in the country as well, uh, and uh, our community will be encouraged to support the ACL petition that's launched tonight. Thank you very much.